Okay, thank you so much for joining us, uh, Honorable. We're so delighted to have you on our show. Good afternoon, good afternoon. Okay, fantastic. Let's just dive right into it. You know, um, I know you're in a mad rush. Um, please just explain to us what the financial adjustment uh, audit bill for 2022 means, what all that is. There's a lot of noise about it. Please just expand on it for our viewers. So what the Minister of Finance is doing is that uh, through the back door, he's trying to seek condonation from Parliament for overspending. Uh, 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 for overspending, for overshooting the budget in respect of the year 2019, uh, around uh, $6 billion. Uh, in 2020, uh, figures in excess of $400 uh, billion. Uh, uh, so he's trying to do this through the medium of a bill called the Financial Adjustment Bill, which was gazetted. Uh, last week on 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 on, on Friday, uh, that is still to be debated uh, in Parliament. All right. So you said through the back door. Do you mind just explaining the legal framework to do the condemnation for unauthorized expenditure? So th there are two things that should happen. Mm -hmm. when, yeah. All all expenditures in Zimbabwean law are controlled by Parliament because parliament controls the consolidated revenue fund. So everything that is uh, paid out of government comes out of the consolidated revenue fund. And the parliament controls the consolidated revenue fund. Every year, the minister of finance goes to parliament and lays before parliament an estimate of expenditures and revenue, which lays on the consolidated revenue fund. We so, do you, you mind just budget. repeating that? So, the budget process. Please, may you just repeat that? Okay. I said, in terms of Section 305 of the Constitution of Zimbabwe, every okay. year the minister must lay out an, ex, a, 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 an estimate of expenditure in revenue, mm -hmm. which will be lev levied or by the Consolidated Revenue Fund. That is called the budget. So, Parliament approves. Where the minister fears that I might actually overspend, he goes to parliament within that year and asks for what is called a supplementary budget. To, mm. So parliament authorized to overspend. Now, okay. here we are talking of 2019 and 2020. Section 307 of the constitution says, where you have spent outside what was provided for by Parliament through the budget, you must present a bill of condonation. But that bill of condonation must be done as soon as possible, in any event, no later than 60 days from the date that you become aware. Oh, and now this is three years later. This is three years later. So the question is, and I raised this when I was chairperson of the Public Accounts Committee, mm. in respect of the 2020, you remember. We had the 2020 financial adjustment bill where the government sought to uh, condone 10.6 billion US dollars yes. overspent between 2015 and 2019. Mm. So where you have gone 60 days beyond the constitution, the constitution does not provide for that. There's a lacuna, a gap in the law. So that is the minister's problem, number one, that his appropriation bill is unconstitutional in that it has been brought beyond 60 days. Oh. All right. So okay. that's the second challenge he has is that when you condone, when you when you seek condonation, you must explain. A condonation is you are asking for indulgence. Yes. So you must explain to Parliament. A condonation is an apology. A condonation is indulgence. So you must explain to Parliament what made you overspend. Mm -hmm. But if you have read the bill, it's three lines. There is no explanation. There is no explanation. So in the absence of an explanation, Parliament can condone. I'm a well, lawyer. It's an incomplete uh, appeal. Uh, exactly, exactly, exactly. Third, 
third, you third, you must have a breakdown of how how you use that money. We can't be asked as members of parliament to simply condone hundred billion dollars, to simply condone six billion dollars without knowing where it was spent. Do you understand what I'm saying? We, we need to know where this money was spent. So, yes. so if we were spent on something that is odious, we've got the right to say no. So if that money was used to buy, as I suspect it was to buy a bank for someone, to buy a, a chrome mine for someone, parliament would have to say no. So you can't just come with figures. And with if parliament does say no, what are the implications? Because this is um, public funds. These the, are public funds. We have a constitutional crisis. A government must resign. Next, the, the, you can't come to parliament without those figures being audited. Remember, there was a 2019 audit yes. by the Auditor General. Mm -hmm. Remember, there was a 2020 audit by the Auditor General. So what it means is that beyond the figures that were audited, you have gone and spent. So in fact, what this shows is that we're dealing with a criminal government. We're dealing with a criminal state. But how would a budget deficit arise over a budget deficit? In 2019, okay. in 2019, there was a budget deficit of US $3.5 billion. In 2020, there was a budget deficit of around $6.8 billion US dollars, by the way. So these figures are now over and above that which has been audited. So they continue to compound. Exactly. So it's like, it's like, it's like, uh, it's what, what they are doing. It's a criminal state. You open the tap. The tap runs. You close the tap and bring the auditor to audit the, the water in your bathtub. But immediately after the auditor has gone, you open the tap again. Okay. And then, and then you go to parliament and just say, we, we opened the tape $100 billion. So the critical question that arises, why did you open the tape when the tape had been closed for the purposes of the official audit done by Mrs. Chiri, done by the Auditor General for 2019 and for 2020? Because now you are creating a budget deficit on top of a budget deficit. And as so you then, say, you are compounding. You are exacerbating. So, so that means possibly so the. It, sorry, go ahead. So it would be improper. Yeah, it would be improper, therefore, for Parliament to be given this bill without the Auditor General having actually audited those amounts mm. and see that there was actually legitimate expenditure. Not That's what I was going to say. To say uh, so, it's the, yeah. the the the, the yeah. Auditor General needs to revise her reports then. He has to audit these amounts and then retrospectively, uh, uh, you know, you know, you know, because what it means is that the statement of accounts presented in 2019 are not genuine. The statement of accounts presented in 2020 are not genuine. Yes. Because over and above this, there was this massive expenditure that, that is running into billions, which the government incurred. All right. Then so I want to talk about. I'm talking about the law. Yes. I'm talking about the law. Yeah, I'm talking about the law. When you remember, when you are now seeking condonation, you are now seeking an appropriation from the consolidated revenue fund. Mm -hmm. So in fact, you need two bills. You don't need an adjustment. You need a bill of condonation and a bill of appropriation. In other words, you need a supplementary budget for 2019 and a supplementary budget for 2020. Right. So yes, right. what did it all wrong? But but Mutuli, I said yesterday in Parliament, Mutuli is a liar, and the speaker asked me to withdraw. But this thing proves he's a liar because all along he has been uh, pitching his mantra and his legacy on, on fiscal surplus, on yes. budgeting the books. He has been boasting that I've been running surpluses, but we know now that he's not been running a surplus. He has been running a budget deficit, but one in fact that is illicit, so illicit that it was in court and discovered by the Auditor General when she audited the books in 2019 and 2020. So in short, Tendai, you are mm. dealing with a criminal state. You are dealing with the rogue state. So in summary, 
That, those are the legal issues. Those are the political issues. Wow. Okay. That's a lot to take in. Um, now I want to talk about the, you remember you mentioned the, the 10 billion and the 6 billion. Let's just go back to that. And now there's this condemnation for another crazy amount of money. Um, what are the implications of these unchecked condemnations on public debt? Number one, so, so, so remember again that the 10.6 10 billion, in other words, the financial adjustment of 2020 is not been passed by parliament because as, as chair of the public accounts committee, I insisted that Mrs. Chile must audit them. And I don't think she has audited the figures. So that bill has not been passed. Before that bill has been passed, they bring yet another bill, you know, for, for 2016, sorry, for 2019 and for, 20, uh, for 2020. 2020. But you asked, me earlier, yeah, you asked me earlier on a question which I deferred and packed. If the minister has failed to bring the adjustment bill or the condemnation bill within 60 days as is demanded, by section 307, what happens next? I submit we've got a constitutional crisis. I submit that we have a constitutional crisis. And I submit that uh, in ordinary circumstances, the government should resign, but we have a constitutional issue on our hands. And I know that lawyers will be going to court, but we do have a constitutional issue on our hands. But still, what are the implications on public debt? That's for the future, but right now, let's, let's, Zimbabwe is on its so, knees in debt. Number one, number one, Tendai. It means that there's no credibility in our public finance management system. Because remember, this is 2022, and the government is basically saying we left out something in 2019 and 2020. But that was not the first time. In 2020, they said we left something. In 2015, in 2016, in 2017. So there's no credibility with our data. We're a failed state, we're a collapsed in state. Mm -hmm. Secondly, it means that the figures of public debt that are being uh, declared are not authentic. That's why all these things are, 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 you know, are coming. Third, so we could be in a deeper situation than what is being reported. I have no doubt about it. There's not been full disclosure, for instance, of how much money we owe to the African Import Index, Af African Bank. There's not been full disclosure on how, how much we actually owe to the Chinese. There's not been full disclosure of how much we actually owe to individuals, local individuals like, like Sekunda and, and Tagbire, who have been lending the government a lot of money, and then foreign uh, uh, you know, you know, you know, ty tycoon, tycoons. So for instance, how much money do we actually owe to traffic Gura for fuel. So the whole thing is a cesspool. It's a sewer, a dog's breakfast, but one which not many dogs would want to be associated with. Right. So and of course, the fourth implication, the fourth implication is that there is a parallel government by, by, by funds that we approve in parliament, but there's a secret nocturnal one which operates Nicodemus. And of course, this also undermines parliament. What is the point of going to parliament, uh, uh, you know, sleeping, you know, you know, you know, at 3 a.m. approving a budget when the budget is meaningless? It's flouted left, right, and center. As I'm talking to you right now, the budget, uh, the, the parliamentary committee on budget and finance has been going in the countryside to hear people's views on the budget. But what is that point? What is the point when parallel budgets are just run elsewhere? Right. Okay. So the budget, the, the announcement is for show, but really the plan is done. There's an undertow. That's what you're saying. It's, 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 it's a worthless exercise because they're going to spend money in Octena through the deep state. So here, what can be done? The, 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 the bottom line, you say I'm being political. We need new leaders. We need a new culture. We need, because the, the problem is not with the law. The problem is with individuals who don't respect the law. And, 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 for, I, and I don't, one of the reasons why I feel so strongly uh, about Mtuli Mube is that he has converted the Minister of Finance, which for all intents and purposes is a regulator, which for all intents and purposes is, is a gatekeeper, because mm -hmm. it has got oversight powers in terms of the Public Finance Act. So the gatekeeper has become the gatecrasher. 
I have no respect for people who don't respect the rules and laws. Chinamasa for all his sins respected the law. So the gatekeeper remains the gatekeeper. And I'm telling you, the Minister of Finance, the gatekeeper has become the gatecrasher. And if you look at that finance adjustment bill, it is condonation of overspending by the Ministry of Finance, not other ministries. If you go to the 2020 uh, financial adjustment bill, there were various ministries, agriculture, ETC, ETC. So but how can we be in this role. situation when we have a central bank? The central bank is part of the problem. In fact, if you were to fully disclose, if they have to this hundred billion dollars, you will find that the central bank is, is you know, you know, you know, occupies a big space in this deep state. So the central bank is not clean. And also remember the central bank is not a regulator, it doesn't regulate the Minister of Finance. So the central bank is also culpable. So you've got the, uh, three gladiators, uh, three toxic gladiators, including uh, John and George Guamatang. I'm sorry, you said, uh, you Professor, so <laughs> Professor so Mugube, uh, John Mugube, John Panone Samangunja and George Gomatang. Right, okay. Those are very big names. So citizens have argued that, and you are of the same opinion, that Ntuli's reported surplus uh, is, is a myth. That's a lie. Okay, so we got cut off there, but the question I was asking was about um, how the uh, Professor Nubia has said, the minister has said we are in a surplus and a lot of people have said it's a myth, including yourself. Now, the government exonerated itself from ongoing protracted crisis citing, citing strong fundamentals from its initiatives that includes fiscal consolidation. After these revelations of staggering fiscal indiscipline, what do you say about this currency and inflation crisis? Are the governments yeah. has been? Yeah, firstly, it speaks to the character of Chudli uh, Ngube. Uh, it, it essentially proves beyond reasonable doubt that he's an extremely uh, dishonest man. He's an extremely dishonorable man. Uh, as I said before, he has built a, a mantra around the uh, surplus. He's mm -hmm. tried to end himself as a man capable of living within his means, as a man who has pursued fiscal consolidation in the last four years that he has been in office. But of course, that bebo uh, has been bust. He has been caught with his knickers uh, 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 down. He has been exposed for what he truly is, uh, namely a fly-by-night charlatan without any honor, without any dignity without any respect. So this is sad. But for the country's uh, economy, uh, this you know, you know, you know, you know, uh, is further evidence that this regime can be trusted, uh, that there is no social contract in Zimbabwe, and that there is no microeconomic stability, that you can't trust uh, this uh, regime. So it's, it's very sad. But I don't think that uh, uh, this is anything new. We always knew. We always knew uh, that there were no surpluses. We always knew that they were engaging in deficit uh, financing. We always knew that uh, they were engaged in the deep state uh, financing uh, terrible nocturnal uh, deals. Uh, we always knew that. But to have it in black and white so clear, so unambiguous, you, you can only sigh and say, my God, uh, in Shona to my way, this is just terrible. Yeah, we're in a terrible situation. But is there a way for yeah. Parliament to find out what the money was spent on? Yes, Parliament has got powers. The Public Accounts Committee has got powers. And there's precedent, which I said when I was chairperson. When that 2020 bill was brought, uh, I sent it to the Auditor General. And we brought the Minister of Finance officials who agreed that 
the figures must be audited first before you go to parliament. So we need to authenticate the figures through a process of auditing. Because you are seeking condonation, you are seeking indulgence uh, from uh, the House of Assembly. So after the, 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 the Auditor General has gone through it, and then what? Then because it must come back to Parliament now. Pro produce a report, and it's brought to, to Parliament. And then what? Would you then hand over to? Because to some action to needs, to, needs to, to be taken. The Auditor General will do a job. Mm -hmm. So the bill is now, now being taken to Parliament with the Auditor General's statement. If the Auditor General qualifies those accounts and says there was fraud, there was chicana, then of course Parliament will refuse to condone. And the, the Public Finance Management Act imposes personal liability uh, on officials. It imposes criminal liability on officials. So everything being equal, it means that someone must fork out from his own pocket those amounts, theoretically. But of course, you and I know that this is a problem. That will not happen. But in a normal country, that's the net effect of that. You have overspent without authority. So pay. The buck stops with you. Right. OK. Um, is it possible that there's going to be jail time if they can't repay? No, 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 no. no. But there will be litigation. I can, I can, I can, I, I'm certainly one of the lawyers that uh, uh, we, we, we would be very active on this issue. Uh, if if you, you have acted out, outside the law, so you must be visited with personal liability uh, because the taxpayer can't pay. You can't expect the taxpayer to carry the burden of your own uh, uh, negligence, your own fraud, your own disrespect. And the uh, taxpayers of, have of, been of paying continually for years now, and the poverty statistics have gone through the roof. And you'll be paying forever, my sister. You're going to be paying. But Madine. Okay. In light of this culture of um, spending outside of parliamentary approval, what can be done to strengthen parliament's oversight role in public finances? Look, parliament has actually been doing a decent job. I mean, they, they've been fantastic reports that uh, have been coming out. Uh, yes, the Public Accounts Committee has really been doing well. The report on Zinara, which I produced, the report on... Uh, the Reserve Bank, the report on the Minister of Finance, uh, the report that uh, I started but was presented by others on command agriculture. So, so Parliament, yes, give it resources, give it technology, give it experts. We, we need clerks that are sharp, clerks that are savvy. But beyond Parliament, what are, are you, the citizens, are you, the NGOs, doing with our reports? Nothing. What would so, you like people to do? Advocacy, advocacy advocacy around these things. Hold MPs to account. Why should you approve a budget which is going to be abused? You, you are not doing that. So parliament is carrying out its own part of the bargain by exposing these things, doing its work of oversight in terms of section 119 of the constitution. But what are you guys also doing? What is the citizen also uh, doing? I don't think the citizen is doing uh, sufficient. Uh, so we need, a, we need a strong civil society. We need a strong state. We don't have a strong state. Oh, right. Okay. I see. So we're in, a, in just a serious mess as a country because on the one hand, the government is abusing public funds, and on the other hand, the citizenry is really doing nothing about it. And, and look, for them to bring this bill it's, it's a measure of restraint. It's a measure of fearing parliament. So parliament is going to do its job. Trust me and I, we're going to hit the roof. We're going to make a lot of noise. But when we do that, what, what is also happening outside parliament? Nothing. So we also, we also need advocates outside to strengthen what we are doing inside. Right. Yeah, this is, this is terrible. We have come to the end of our interview, but before we go, before we close, we play a little game on our show. Uh, so what happens is the, the previous guest will ask you a question. It's a blind game. The previous guest will ask you a question and then you answer, you have to answer. And in turn, you ask the next person 
the question. So your question is, besides taxing the rich, what can be done to address the inequality crisis in Zimbabwe to reduce in, uh, um, in line with the SDG goal number 10, sustainable development goal number 10? Let's, let's build a strong, functional, inclusive economy. Because when we have a, a weak economy, you create distortions and disequilibriums. And the disequilibriums are twofold. Number one, your, your, your inequality ratios increase. Two, your corruption is also a byproduct of inequality. So it becomes a self-replicating uh, cycle. Let's build a strong, inclusive economy with 100% employment. Then we can cut the gap between the rich and the poor, and we can achieve uh, some of our SDG goals. How long will that take, though? This is now me asking, not the previous case. Uh, I strongly believe, as someone who has run the Ministry of Finance, I strongly believe that uh, you can turn around this economy and actually build a, a very strong economy inside uh, five years. You can, you can do that. Okay, that's what, decent. That's what, one term. Yeah, that's one term. What you have a problem, which I think is the biggest uh, 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 challenge we face, is the loss of values of the citizen, the zanification of the citizen, the assumption that you can make money uh, without going to school, the undermining of education, the undermining of the dignity of, 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 of hard work, the creation of false heroes like Philip Chiangwa, like Wigner uh, Chivayo, like uh, Jinimbi and others, the undermining of the, the, moral, the decay in the moral fabric of the society. That's what worries me, because we are now creating generations that don't respect education, that don't respect the dignity. And of they all Hadley. aspire to be being. To, to, they all aspire to be being. They all aspire to live in Borodo, Bruko, Roshawacha. They all aspire to, to, uh, to drive Lamborghinis and, and other expensive, you know, you know, you know, and you have got, you have got people that think that uh, just by dressing up and putting makeup, I can I can have a life, uh, you know, you know. So it's a it's a sad situation. It's a sad situation. We need to restore the dignity of hard work, the dignity of education. I come, I grew up in poverty. I grew up in a two-roomed house, and without education, I would have been I don't know, possibly dead. But my parents inculcated in me the dignity of hard work, the dignity uh, of labor, and, and 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 because of education, I can speak English better than the Englishman himself. So <laughs> so I. The dignity of, of 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 hard work. Okay, all right. Thank you for that. What's your question to our next guest? I well, I think uh, I think that uh, my question would be: How do you how do you make the youth who are sixty nine percent of the population? How do you make them part of this conversation? Part of the conversation around economic justice, around corruption, around illicit financial uh, flows? How do we capture the imagination of the youth, the millennials, so that they are part of this conversation, mm -hmm. so that they seem to be objects, but they are players? Right, I can't wait to hear what they have to say because there's a lot of apathy. 69% is a great big part of the population, that's the majority, and within them, so, there's so much apathy. So, Put it simply, how do you capture the Instagram generation into this content? Yeah, maybe go to Instagram and do something there. How do you convert the makeup artist into this conversation? <laughs> you have something against makeup, don't you? Absolutely not. I love mascara. <laughs> What's your favorite brand? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> okay, thank you so much, Honorable. It has been a pleasure doing this. It really has been a pleasure. And thank you for your time. I know you're in the, in the middle of a lot right now. And we really appreciate it. Parliament, in case they might pass the PVO. <laughs> okay, thank, thank you. Thank you. All right.